Hello and welcome back, Royal Family. January 10th, Year of Our Lord 2021. 11021 is the date. The title is the Divine Decree. Singular, even though we talk about decrees, plural. Uh, when God says something, it's done once and it's done for all times. That means all the plans for your life, everything that's ever happened in human history for everybody's life. We could say we're all in the divine decrees. Everybody had their separate decree. Yet when God does something, it's done in a second. Like that. So we have to say it in the singular decree. I'll explain that a little bit today. I think you're going to find this very interesting today. I want to say a couple things. Um, there's a lot of nervousness going on, a lot of panic, and a lot of rumors floating around. People ask what I personally believe. So here you go again. I'll give it to you real quick. My personal belief, research, and opinion is that January 20th will display... <laughs> Either the same administration staying in with a new VP or are uh, ushered into socialism. So um, I believe the uh, first one. Um, I believe some things are going on behind the scenes. I actually believe there's been a, uh, I would guess I would say a soft version of a civil war going on behind the scenes for about the better part of three and a half, four years. So um, what that means is you might not have seen weapons. It's been more of an information warfare, civil war, uh, manipulation, civil war, uh, overthrowing like a soft coup, trying to overthrow uh, the gentleman in the White House. So there's a lot of things going on, you know. Um, I'm getting good news from my resources that our current president, who is either going to stay or be stepping out in a couple weeks, is safe. Um, but he is um, keeping a low profile because certain things are going on. So we will see. We relax because we trust in the Lord. We know what's coming. Whether it's today, tomorrow, or five years from now, we know the rapture is inevitable. And if you don't believe that the tribulation period is being built all around you and you're not going to feel a pinch or some discomfort or a little bit of anxiety over what is being built around you, you're fooling yourself. I wrote the book, Discerning Our Time. My book displays the template of what is coming, what is being built, what has been being built all around us, folks. Here in America, across the world, really, but here in America in the last 75 or 80 years, more so than any time in our history. So, if it's being built all around us because the tribulation period does not spring up overnight, one world government, one world movement, one world dollar, one world religion doesn't spring up overnight. And America just doesn't disappear or morph into something new overnight. It is a process. We've been living in the process that has been rapidly going downhill quickly in the past 30 years or so, 20 years, whatever you want to give or take a few years here and there. So um, if you're surprised by some of the things you're going to see or some of the things that might happen, you really don't understand what the tribulation period is all about and the Antichrist is all about. Having said that, I'm going to touch on some things. I might even do a an announcement an announcement type of prediction thing in the next couple weeks. I have to relax and really pray and think about it. I've looked at my resources, but nobody knows 100% what's happening. God is in control, okay? So we can have some good sources, but if something is going on like a soft civil war behind the scenes, you don't know who's going to win just yet. We can pray that God works his hand and keeps us around longer, but the rapture is inevitable. So we relax in that. Having said that, we're going to jump into it because people have asked me questions. I know there's concerns. I don't want all that stuff floating out there. I want you to relax, get into the Word of God. No greater time now than evangelize. No greater time now than to grow up spiritually and start learning to apply faith and the application of the Word of God you should have circulating in your soul and apply that new nature to your life. Walk in a nature that reflects Jesus Christ. No better time than now. No better time than now. In fact, I believe my personal opinion is that God allowed certain things to happen in the recent years and to be revealed to us so that we would wake up. God always gives us warnings before the discipline comes. God always gives us opportunities to turn back before the problems arise. God always gives us solutions before the problems arise. The problem is most people don't heed the call all around them and certainly in the Word of God. That's the problem. So... Having said that, here we go. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw His glory. Glory is the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. 
And like newborn babes, long for that pure milk of the word, so that by it you may grow, I may grow, we all may grow in respect to our salvation. We need to wash the sin from our life, folks, get focused on the word, get our fellowship in order to really absorb the word of God. So having said that, I read from 1 John 1, 8, 9, and 10. If we say believers, 1 John 1, 8, John is speaking to believers that we have no sin. We are deceiving ourselves. The truth is not in us. 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins, cleansing us from all unrighteousness. And verse 10 says, believers, if we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar. His word is not in us. So let's take a moment of silent prayer right now. Every head is bowed, every eye is closed. Let's keep everything in prayer. Relax, take a deep breath, look for the balance in everything. Understand that you're protected as a believer. Do you feel a pinch or some discomfort? And sometimes we get a little bit of, uh, of the overflow of discipline because we're in and around certain things that have happened. Yes, but we are not here for the wrath of God. We will re be removed for the full wrath of God. Keep that in mind. Every head is bowed, every eye is closed. Father, we thank you for this time we have to come and study your word. And Father, we're asking you to bless these messages. Take them out to a lost and dying world. And Father, whoever stumbles on these messages, let them be able to grow, Father. Really listen subjectively, I mean, excuse me, objectively, objectively, Father, objectively listen, whether they are unbelievers or believers, and maybe gain some of your wisdom, your mind, your knowledge from this, Father, that they can learn and go forward, because now is the time. There is no more time to play games with your word and what we apply and how with direction this world is going in. The games are over. The lazy attitude should be over, Father. We're asking these things. We're asking for your healing hand for the virus and the vaccines to clarify these things, Father. We're asking for protection of our current president in the White House. We know certain things are going on, Father. We might not understand everything. You are in control. Let us relax in that. And when the time comes, Father, for us to make the right decisions and stand up for certain things. Let us do it in the right way. We're asking for all these things, Father, through your Son's precious name, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The title is The Divine Decree. The Divine Decree. So I'll explain that as we go. Our, our study is in Matthew chapter 17. I actually turned my lights up, my studio lights up here a little brighter. I want to make sure... Uh, I don't want to look too pale, but by the same token, I don't want to um, have it too um, shadowy. And it's hard when you're in a little basement studio by yourself trying to figure these things out uh, when you're not a, a technical guy. So hopefully it'll work out good. So our study is in chapter uh, 17 of Matthew. Go ahead and go there. It's brought us to a study on faith and the lack thereof of faith, which causes believers to fail in their attempts to gain momentum in God's plan. What we've been looking at is a faith issue. A study in faith and the lack thereof faith, which causes believers to fail in their attempts to gain momentum in God's plan and apply certain things. And they wonder why it didn't go their way. Just showing you some examples in the last couple lessons. I got some good feedback on it, so I know people are listening and gaining some momentum, which is awesome. Um, it means God, the Holy Spirit's working in me and you both. The inaccurate application. The inaccurate application was the issue that some of the apostles were facing when they failed to heal a demon-possessed boy. Their measure of faith was not enough or their application was wrong. And we need to look at this when things fail in our life and we think we're applying the word of God or doing something in God's plan. Their measure of faith was not enough or their application was wrong. Don't put it on God and say, well, he abandoned me. That's probably not the issue. He very rarely abandons anybody. What he does, and when he has to, he really just steps back and allows some form of discipline or something to happen because he's gone far enough with you like any good parent does and realizes you're not getting it, and they have to step back a little bit. But he's always there. So their measure of faith was not enough, or their application was wrong, one or the other. I told you that the mountain analogy from verse 20 was pointing out the size of the challenge or the problem and that perhaps their faith was not all they had thought it was in that moment of time. Perhaps their faith was not all they thought it was in that moment of time for that mountain that was in front of them. I also mentioned that in verse 21, 
It is not in the original context, but was a King James add-on, we would say, that we need not concern ourselves with. So let's look at the lesson for today and jump into it. Matthew 17, 22. I think you brought, I brought you up to speed if you just got on this channel. And listen, if you just got on this channel, you can go back oh, well over a year, almost two years now, and get back into Matthew 1, where I was doing 30 or 40 minute messages on Matthew chapter 1 until the Spirit pushed me. So you can catch all the way up if you're interested in really growing and learning principles. You just got to follow the videos on the channel or ask me for the notes. I put them in Word document. I put them on PRB Ministry Facebook page, which that'll be a discussion for another day, what I trust in the media now as far as those platforms. But I can get you the notes. So you need to catch up. So don't feel like you're lost because you're in Matthew 17 and you want to know what happened from the lesson in Matthew 1. It is there. I can get it to you. Matthew 17, 22. That's where we left off. And while they were gathering together in Galilee, Jesus said to them, The Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men, 23, and they, were, they will kill him, and he will be raised on the third day, and they were deeply grieved. Now, he started to go over these principles, and he's going over them again about the crucifixion and what is to come. They're starting to get a clear picture. The apostles are having an emotional response. That on one hand, we all understand. You'd be foolish to say, well, I wouldn't get emotional. I'd understand the cross completely. If you were walking and talking with Jesus for over two years like these men were at this point in time, and he started talking about the crucifixion, picking up your cross, that I have to die, that these things have to happen, it would be a little scary for you because you would be in love with him at this point by realizing who and what he is. And it would have an emotional response. But on the other hand, for the sake of these men gaining spiritual maturity and getting ready for the church age leadership roles, they cannot afford this. They cannot afford emotional responses. Most of the time, they get us into trouble. Emotions could have stopped the plan of God if the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ allowed that to become the driving force in his life, which means his emotions would have took the steering wheel, and at some point, it would have went from uh, just emotions to a sin issue because once the emotions start to relate reactions and actions in your life habitually you're into sin you have to be very careful so i understand we all understand emotions but they need to be under some kind of authority otherwise you're in trouble the apostles at this point would have allowed emotions to interrupt the plan of god at this point they would have allowed the emotions to interrupt the plan of god that's why that's saying about that uh, uh, Jesus says to Peter, get behind me, Satan. It's because you don't understand the plan of God. You're getting in the way. No salvation for anyone. That would have been the issue we've been talking about today had the cross not occurred the way it did. No salvation for anyone. As I mentioned to you in a recent lesson, we cannot stop the plan of God. We only interfere and complicate our own plans and actually our own blessings and rewards. That's what happens. But God, God will always have his goals and plan come to fruition. He will always have his goals and plans come to flu, 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 excuse me, fruition. And you get left in the dust stumbling around in your own plan because you didn't follow along and flow. Remember I told you, flow inside the plan of God. Agree to God's plan and get in it. Turn to 1 John chapter 3. Go to 1 John chapter 3 with me, royal family. 1 John chapter 3. Again, I want to thank everybody for any cards that came in late or donations or anything for the holidays. A couple things came in late. Um, a couple people gave me some uh, donations around New Year's or the couple days after. I greatly appreciate it. This ministry cannot survive without people supporting it in different realms. So, And I believe today is um, Gloria's birthday in Texas. She runs my Facebook page, PRB Ministry Facebook. Big shout out to her, guys. She's helped a lot. She's introduced this ministry probably to about two dozen people, maybe more, just by her putting my messages up there. So she's done a lot. So let's give her a you know, round of applause, keep her in prayer. Her and her husband, Al, and our uh, brothers and sisters in Christ from a long time ago, folks. Now, God's goals and plans are already completed because of his decree in eternity past. We need to understand that. The divine decrees are the sum total of God's plan designed in eternity past. He's not flying by the seat of his pants. Every time you do something, he's like, oh my gosh, i got to change the plan. That's not how it works. I've tried to drive that home. You need to understand that. It is singular divine decree 
even though we could literally say, well, everybody's plan is different, this is different, this dispensation is different, so they're all different decrees. Yes, but with God, it's one. One and done. It's singular. Because when God sets plans into action, it is done the moment he thought of it. I explained that last lesson. When Jesus Christ stood up millions of years ago, and the Trinity were having a discussion about how they would deal with the angelic rebellion and create this race lower than the angels to resolve all this rebellion issue, Jesus stood up and said, I'll go to the cross. At the moment he said it, at the moment he thought it, it was done. We need to kind of understand that. I know I'm bringing it down to a basic level, but that's what a pastor is supposed to do. Bring it down to a level where a seventh grader could understand it. When Christ said in eternity past, out of the Trinity, I will go to the cross. It was done. It was done. It was just a matter of following through. It was never going to be stopped. The plan centers around the person of Jesus Christ. Everything. He is the center of the universe. Until you get that through your head, you will not understand um, the plan of God. And who Jesus Christ is. Everything centers on him. That is why in true Christianity, and when you head towards the end times like we are, the name Jesus Christ will always cause an issue and put people against the wall. Because they have to make a decision. Is it Christ or no? Do you know who Jesus Christ is? That's the issue. Everything centers on him. As revealed from commands in 1 John uh, 3.23, Ephesians 1, 4 through 6. We're going to look at 1 John chapter 3. But it's revealed that Christ is the center in many, many scriptures. I give you a few examples. So while you go to 1 John 3, let us look at Ephesians chapter 1 quickly. Ephesians 1, 3. Blessed be the God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us previous, already done, done. Who has blessed us, not who may bless us, who's going to bless us in the future, done. With every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, not in you, not in anything else. It all revolves around Jesus Christ. The word who is not in the original context there. It is not where it says who has. Who is not in the original context. It's actually better translated if you break it down as the one having blessed us. That's how it would say. So if you remove the who, it's more related to the one having blessed us, meaning God the Father in his original decree from eternity past is the one who's already put that in the plan for you. In the grammatic sense, God the Father produces the action of the verb. Many of you heard that before from other men that teach accurately. Um, the grammatic sense, God the Father produces the action of the verb. He gave the benefit already. Any benefit, blessing, reward, crown, whatever it is, we call it escrow blessing. He gave it already. Before we were created, you have to get that through your head. Because a lot of people think they affect the plan of God. They don't. They either flow with it and go, but God's, they either flow with God's plan and they come to fruition in the right way, or they end up being left in the dust fumbling around and they have to come back in the plan of God at some other time. But God's plan is not going to be interrupted. Before we were created, so we never take credit for any blessings or rewards. We can't. Ephesians 1.4 goes on to say what? Just as he chose us in him, before the foundation of the world. When you see that statement, before the foundation of the world, certainly in the New Testament Greek, it always speaks to eternity past. It's pointing you to millions and millions of years ago. That we would be wholly blameless before him, meaning set apart, special, in love. Verse 5, he predestined us to adoptions as sons and daughters. We could say we're all falling under the same principle. This is not um, because it's in the masculine um, how it's how it's written. We don't get into craziness. We don't exclude the ladies, and we don't do political correctness and change the word of God. We understand the principle. He predestined us to adoptions as sons, as family, through Jesus Christ to Himself, according to what the kind intention of His will, pointing to the Father's plan. Unfortunately, <laughs> there was a uh, a French pastor and theologian. Many of you know this from the Reformation movement back in the 1500s, named John Calvin. Just going to touch on this today. I actually did a study on uh, certain things about the tulip principle with John Calvin. He taught great principles. I can't hold a candle to this man for what I understand about him. He taught great principles. And he was accurate about many of his doctrinal statements. Listen to me carefully. But he taught a skewed version of what we would say election and predestination. A skewed version. That really excludes large portions of humanity. 
Does God exclude anybody? No, not really if you understand his word. So, John Calvin, biblical genius? Absolutely on a lot of levels. A lot of people are. Is his version on election and predestination a little bit skewed? I believe so. Many men would back me on that. My lineage, those men that have trained me, the lineage I'm in, would back me on that. And the scripture actually backs me on it. But you can believe what you want. We're not going to get into arguing all this. I'm going to make some examples, and you can go back and find my teaching on this. But today should give you some basic examples. Calvinism at its core. John Calvin. Calvinism at its core. Because Calvinism split off like all these other denominational things and beliefs and everything. They all split off and splintered off over the years since the 1500s, 1400s, 1200s. Calvinism at its core teaches that certain groups of people are chosen from eternity past and others are excluded. Not the God I know. Therefore, free will is eliminated because there's no other way around it. They say it's not, but it would be. Free will would be eliminated, which does not fit neatly into Scripture, folks. It simply does not. That is the quick overview. I'm not going to go into details, and I'm sure some Calvinists will get angry and stamp their feet right now, and I know I'll hear about it. They'll disagree. That's fine and good. You believe in Jesus Christ in the, in the proper way. You understand your Bible the proper way. You're going to heaven. I'm not going to argue with you about predestination and election. I can show you enough scriptures and show you the essence and personality of God that doesn't make sense with that doctrine. Many Calvinists stand by the doctrine of limited atonement. Limited atonement, meaning only certain ones in eternity past, and oh well, the others simply won't choose the right path. I believe, most people I know in my lineage believe in unlimited atonement. Unlimited. John Calvin was a great man of God. Listen to me carefully. John Calvin was a great man of God, along with many others. Even in my own lineage, great pastors and theologians have areas where they may have imparted some doctrinal terms, doctrinal statements that we can put into question concerning the full accuracy of their statements. Now, I know some people are going to say, well, what about this? And what about the man who trained you? And what about the lineage of Lewis Berry Schaefer and the colonel? Listen, listen, I bow down to their authority. But only the perfect one died on the cross. You understand what I'm telling you? The perfect one died on the cross. That is why it is important to become a good student of the word so that God, the Holy Spirit, can give you solid discernment about what you are learning and it is the reason that no pastor or professor or theologian should demand you blindly follow everything they teach and you won't listen to anything else just be able to back it up with scripture and understand the historic context some of the original language how it's used the scripture back up scripture remember those ice principles so many calvinists i'm going to say this again stand by the doctrine of limited atonement i do not I believe in unlimited atonement. That doesn't take a lot from John Calvin because a lot of his stuff is really good. And if you understand him, there are some that say in his writings it points to unlimited atonement if you really understand it. But it's splintered off over the years. But at the core, many believe limited atonement. John Calvin was a great man of God, way better than me. <laughs> so I'm not trying to say anything like that, along with many others. Even in my own lineage. There are great pastors and theologians, okay, that have areas where they may have imparted some doctrinal terms and statements that we can put into question concerning the full accuracy of the statement. Believers in Christianity run into problems when they elevate a man too high behind the pulpit. They run into problems. This is why it is so important to become a good student of the Word so that God the Holy Spirit can give you solid discernment about what you are learning. Solid discernment. Now, many of the men in my lineage, or even John Calvin, have all their gospel messages about believing on Jesus Christ um, pretty well in line. So I'd have to agree with all that. Many of them understand dispensations, all these different things, but are there some terms or things that they have said or um, statements that they stand by that are a little skewed occasionally? Yes, this is a big one. Election predestination is a big one. So for all you Calvinists out there, believe what you want. I'll see you in heaven. We'll argue there. It is the reason that no pastor or professor should demand you blindly follow everything they teach. 
We have freedom. You're a believer priest. You grow under a pastor teacher. You make your own choices. When it gets to a point where that pastor can't teach you anymore or you disagree, then you can move on or make a decision. Ephesians 1.4. Having said that, let's jump into Ephesians 1.4, which I have on the board. It actually points to the doctrine of election. Ephesians 1.4 points to the doctrine of election. Let me grab a drink. I'm a little dry. I hate to have to preach hard like that, but it's part of my personality. And it's also simply when you know something to be true and you can't buy into it, you have to preach against it. Sorry. Ephesians 1.4. He chose us in him before the foundation of the world. All members of the human race are potentially elected to the plan of God by the doctrine of what? Unlimited atonement. Underline that. Unlimited atonement. We share in the election of Jesus Christ, folks. This is set in a present tense, how it's written in the scripture. Present tense, meaning always was, continues to be. Always will be, and it continues to be that way. So, again, take a note on this. Let's understand these principles. Digest what I'm telling you before you argue with me if you're a Calvinist. Digest some of the things I'm telling you. And actually, there's an older message I did on, uh, I think it was the tulip principle. I might have even did it when I was a deacon training to be a pastor, which would go back to like 2012 or 13. Um... I was an assistant to a pastor, Pastor Bob at Grace Bible Church, and I think I taught something on Calvinism before from the pulpit there. You'd have to dig in their archives if it's not here. The point being, folks, in the doctrine of election, it is what you believe to be true. You've got to come to your, you got to get your scriptures, get your facts in order, listen to both sides, and come to your decision. I'm not going to hit you over the head. God elected some, and others have no opportunity to be saved. That's your first choice. God elected some in eternity past, and others have no choice or no opportunity to be saved. They're simply going to be negative for their whole life. Do you really believe that? Good question to ask. Or, did God offer it to everyone, and some would reject the call because of free will? Which is what I believe. Did God offer it to everyone, the whole world, everybody, and some would reject the call because of free will, our freedom? Or don't we have the freedom to do that? That's where you need to start asking yourself. The simple answer in the scriptures, and the one in particular, says it all. John 3, 16. Actually, 3, 15, 16 speak about this. For God so loved the world. Not a group. The world. Cosmic. Cosmos in the Greek. Means all the world. Means Satan's world that he's in control of, that God allowed him to be in control of. God loves it all. He loves the unbelievers. He loves everybody. That he gave his only begotten son that whoever, no way to get around that one, whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. That's the God I know. I will not get into deep principles about election today or our focus will remain on what? Introducing the divine decree. Though the doctrine of election is encapsulated inside God's divine decree, it can become confusing to set up a lesson and bounce all over the place. We need to keep our laser focus on divine decree today. That's what we will. So I'm not going to get into deep principles. I'm feeding you enough to start giving your mind something to think about in the area of election and predestination. Ephesians 1.4, that we would what? That we would be holy, blameless before him, meaning really set apart, it means that we believers keep on being, present tense, set apart in our new nature, in our walk here, in his sight, in our position, we are covered by the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Nothing you did, nothing you earned. Therefore, in the temporal, we have access to reflect that perfect righteousness. We get filled with the Spirit, walking in the new nature. But more so in eternity, we are forever bound by our union with him, Jesus Christ, forever. You cannot lose it. It's called eternal security, folks. There are denominations that teach you you can be a really bad boy or a bad girl and lose your salvation, and then you have to come back in and get born again and saved again, so you have to bounce in and out, which tells me the cross wasn't enough. You're arrogant enough to challenge the cross and what Jesus Christ did? It wasn't enough for you? was enough for me, my studies. Ephesians 1.5 tells us he predestined us for adoption. This does not mean free will does not play a role, folks. He predestined us for adoption. Free will plays a role. 
You have to you have to acknowledge it. Without free will, we are robots. Without our freedom that God gives us, our free will, our volition, whatever you want to call it, we're robots. Do you think God does a loving person want a robot? This is the think about the husband that is so jealous and possessive that he tries to control his wife, or the wife does it too to manipulate sometimes. Um, that they really want a robot. That's not real love. That's not because real love means freedom. That's not the God I know. Okay, that's not real love. That's control. That's a control freak. Without free will, we are robots. And the angelic warfare would make no sense at all. Why we were created. The angelic spiritual warfare would make no sense without free will. What difference would it make if Job, Abraham, you and I are put on the witness stand or placed in the heat of spiritual combat? What difference would it make if free will wasn't there? Why would Job need to go through what he did and give us an example? Or Abraham, you and I even. Why would we need to be involved in spiritual warfare and the angelic conflict and go on the witness stand? All these things, principles we learn if we didn't have free will. You have to think about these things, folks. What would it prove? What would it prove? What difference would it make for the unbelievers that they would need to hear the gospel and that we treat them with impersonal, unconditional love? Why would we do that? They're going to remain unbelievers. They're just going to remain, most of them are going to remain unbelievers. Or we're supposed to secretly go out somehow and figure out who might believe or not. Or we just spread the gospel out there and those that God chose in eternity past are going to come forward and the rest are going to say no. So we just forget about them after they say no to a few times. I don't know. I don't know the math behind it. I don't know how they think about it when it comes to limited atonement. I believe in unlimited atonement. Free will. Free will would make no sense even from the standpoint of the original man and woman in the garden. When you really break it down, free will would make no sense even from the standpoint of the original man and woman in the garden. Doesn't make sense to me, and I'm, but I'm not that bright. I'm not the brightest bulb in the tree, so who knows? Maybe uh, those that follow a staunch Calvinist belief of limited atonement got it right. Either way, I'm going to heaven. I'm going to stick with what I believe, what God the Holy Spirit leads me in my teaching. The doctrine of predestination is not locked and loaded so that only a certain number of people gain salvation. It's just not. That goes against simple scriptures. Simple scriptures like John 3.16 I showed you. Uh, Romans 5.8. 1 uh, Timothy 1.15-16. I'll say them again. Jot them down and look at this, those three. I'd probably give you about six more. John 3.16. Romans 5.8. 1 Timothy 1, 15 and 16. It goes against the nature of God as well. If you understand, one of the things you should do as you grow is understand God's divine essence, his personality, who he is. If you understand who he is, his nature, it go, this goes against limited atonement, goes against who God is. It just does, the God that I know. Doctrines of predestination and election all fall under the divine decree. So we can view them from the standpoint in the series, and I'll open them up to you. But I'm not going to go in-depth against uh, the Calvinist viewpoint, because I've done it before. I'll do it again when the Spirit leads me that way. But I think some of this alone would make you look at it and say, is this what I believe, that some were chosen in eternity past, and the rest of us are going to heaven, some were chosen to go to hell? Because that's what it says. I don't care how they dress it up, and they do verbal gymnastics. To make it sound like God is being fair. It just doesn't sound right to me. It doesn't line up with scripture. Doesn't. And yes, I said series. Okay. The standpoint from this series. This will take a few hours to properly teach. You cannot teach divine decree um, in a 45, 50 minute message. Sorry. So buckle up. 1 John 3.18. 1 John 3.18. You guys should be there. 1 John 3, 18, little children, let us not love with word or with tongue, but in deed and truth. He's really talking to believers here, those in the family. Notice, though, application. 1 John 3, 18, application, and here we go. What's that word with the begins with an R that I brought up in the last three or four months that people hate to hear? Responsibility. 1 John 3, 18 points to application, meaning responsibility. That comes to light. 1 John 3, 19, we will, know by, we will know by this that we are of the truth and will assure our heart before him in verse 19, uh, 1 John 3, 20, in whatever our heart condemns us, for God is greater than our heart, he knows all things. 
Excuse me if the dog's running around. I know my wife just went out. She's probably coming back. I told her to be quiet, but my 85-pound baby is running around up there. Probably going to bark. Um, 2021, we got some things happening where the studio might get better. It's going to take a while. I'm just going to... My announcements are coming soon. Just relax. First John 3.20. And whatever our heart condemns us, for God is greater than our heart and knows all things. Our heart, your soul structure, when it is properly motivated by God, the Holy Spirit, and Bible doctrine, it will guide us, not condemn us but convict us about our choices. That's really what happens. Convict, not condemn. Even when the condemnation comes in from our flesh, it's telling us God is greater than all of that. That's really what it's saying. God knows all things because God is the author of all things. Divine decree, God knows all things. He can handle all things, even our fleshly thoughts, because he is the author of all things, which tells us, Divine decree, that's what it points to. This is pointing us to the doctrine of divine decree. 1 John 3, 21, Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence before God. Verse uh, 22, And whatever we ask, we receive from him. That goes back to the faith issue. If your faith is strong enough, the measure of your faith. Verse 22, Because we keep his commandments, we're following something, flowing with something, and do the things that are pleasing in his sight. Not a works program. You just got with the program. You adjusted to the justice of God, verse 22. Because in the temporal, right now, when we adjust to the justice of God and flow inside the plan of God, habitually our prayers and life become in harmony with his plan. Because in the temporal, right now, in time, when we adjust to the justice of God, which I explained to you, starts with naming and citing sin, acknowledging when you failed. That's adjusting to the justice of God. You don't have to beg. You don't have to cry about it. You just have to say, Father, uh, this sin is a problem for me. Uh, my sin of anger today got to the best of me. In Jesus' name, amen. It's forgiven. It's washed away. You acknowledge. You name and cite it. You're adjusting to the justice of God. The secondary adjust to the justice of God after after you cleanse yourself clean, is to look at his word, his principles, and say, I need to operate in my new nature and flow in the way he's telling me to go. Plain and simple. We adjust to the justice of God. We flow inside the plan of God habitually. Our prayers, our life is in harmony with his plan. Therefore, we are elevated to greater grace and escrow blessings begin to pop open along the path in our future. That's what happens. 1 John 3.23 goes on to say, This is his commandment, that we believe in the name of his Son, Jesus Christ. Keep it simple. That's the first part. And love one another, impersonal, unconditional. You can't do that from your flesh, just as he commands us. So those are some of the commands. We have to first and foremost believe in Jesus Christ. And because we do, we need to operate the way Christ did. We cannot do that from our flesh. We have to be filled with the Spirit to reflect Jesus Christ, washing the garbage from our life, applying his mind so that we love one another in the proper way, not emotional nonsense, just as he commands us. Verse 24, 1 John 3, 24. The one who keeps his commands, there, this is what he's talking about. This is how you grow in the uh, plan of God. Keeps his commands, abides in him habitually. You're going to fall and have bad days. And he in him, we know by this, that he abides in us by the spirit whom he has given us. The helper, it's called parakletos in the Greek. These scriptures right here, these scriptures that you looked at right there, are clear teaching on the plan of God and the Trinity in action within the plan of God. The plan of God, the divine decree, and the Trinity operating for us in the plan of God. Go to Acts chapter 2 with me. Acts chapter 2. lot to take in, but I think you're going to get a lot from this. And it's going to be hard to deny how God works in his divine decree when we're done with this. Probably going to at least be a two-part series. I don't know if it's going to be three, but it has to go into a series for me to get everything out. That's where the Spirit leads me. Entrance into the plan of God is based on the principle of grace, whereby the sovereignty, the all-powerful sovereignty, when you say all-powerful God and the free will of man meet where? 
at the cross. So this removes mankind getting involved in any of this. Can never get credit for it, folks. Mankind benefits under the work of the triune God, plain and simple. And obviously Jesus Christ being number one in our life. Not because we deserve it or earn it. We are incapable of that in the flesh. Therefore, God knew that in eternity past, when He before, long before he created us. So he gives us an avenue in the temporal to be able to connect to the spiritual. That's where the rubber meets the road. He gives us an avenue in the temporal time we're living here to touch into the spiritual, which we're going to be secured in once we believe in Jesus Christ. Man has never benefited under God's plan. Man has never benefited under God's plan by what? His talent. See, I thought I was going to say something else. We benefit, but it's not by our talent, our IQ, our works, our thoughts, our plans. Man is blessed on the basis of who and what God is and what God has provided through grace. I'll say it again. Man is never benefit under God's plan, but you have to add to that sentence. Man is never benefited under God's plan by his talent, flesh, his works, things we can do, his thoughts, our IQ, or his plans, our plans. Man is blessed on the basis of who and what God is and what God has provided through grace. There it is again. If you don't understand grace, you get confused. The crucifixion of Christ is related to the divine decree and predetermined plan of God. The crucifixion of Christ is related to the divine decree and the predetermined plan of God. Acts 2, 22. Acts 2, 22. Look at Acts 2, 22. Men of Israel, listen to these words. Jesus the Nazarene, a man attested to you by God with miracles and wonders and signs which God performed through him, humanity of Christ, in your midst, just as you yourselves know, Acts 2.23. This man, Jesus Christ, understand that principle. Jesus Christ, the unique God-man. This man delivered over by the predetermined plan. There it is right there. And foreknowledge of God. This is where they get off to. When they get into predetermined foreknowledge, they say, well, God knew who would be born again and saved and who wouldn't be born again and saved. They're absolutely right when they say that. But he didn't block those who didn't. He gave choices. Free will. Delivered over by the predetermined plan and the foreknowledge of God. You nailed to a cross by the hands of godless men and put him to death. The plan is related to a decree. Counsel, a decree. Understand that. The word you're looking at there is boule. <laughs> boule, we'll look at it in a minute. So Acts 2.24 goes on to say, But God raised him up again, putting an end to the agony of death, since it was impossible for him to be held in the power of death. Acts 2.23 tells us Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God. The word plan is a word really we can use for counsel. Or it's a Greek word we know called boule, decree, you can say. Same thing. Decree. So Jesus Christ was delivered by the predetermined purpose of God the Father. The plan laid in eternity past. Predestination, folks. All my slides are good today. See, I don't get flustered. If my slides are good, my notes are good, I don't get flustered and say a scripture and describe a scripture quickly and gloss over it. Every once in a while, the devil gets the best of me. I get a little tired or flustered. Don't get all my slides and notes in order, and it puts me in a different direction. We all have those days. I think I did that last lesson with a scripture on Moses. I said something about him being old, and it was, no, he was holding his hands up to hold another lesson for another day. But I missed a scripture, um, not a scripture, I missed a slide or two last time. So I read them to you, but I didn't put them on the board. I think the slides are extremely helpful. It gives you a moment to note them down. It's how I was taught. It's the way I'm going forward teaching. So whether you like it or not, they're always going to be there. And if you come to a conference, I set up a slide on a screen somewhere. So it helps me. It helps you. Predestination inevitably involves the person of Jesus Christ. Inevitably involves Jesus Christ. Therefore, it is related to the doctrine of divine decree. The plan of God designed what? In eternity past. When you hear divine decree, realize it was from eternity past. It centers upon the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. It does not conflict with free will. I'll leave it up there for you. 
It does not. It would not make sense if it conflicted with free will. If God, if God allowed free will one time and then another day he didn't, for this person he did, for that person he didn't, free will has to be given and, and, and uh, doled out, I would say, across the board. And it was given for the angels because angels had a choice to, to excuse me, rebel or not rebel against God. That shows free will. We wouldn't have a rebellion with uh, Satan and his army, a third of the angels swept away, which means, and I can tell you, all angels made a choice to come back. All angels fell at some point or another, made a choice to come back. That's a lesson for another day. That's what I believe. But the ones that stuck their ground and did not return and did not choose the right side, they made a choice just like unbelievers do. Sooner or later, that choice was taken away. Just like an unbeliever's at death, that choice is taken away. Up until the moment they die, that choice is there. Predestination inevitably involves the person of Jesus Christ. And therefore, it is related to the doctrine of divine decree, the plan of God designed in eternity past. It centers upon the person of Jesus Christ. It was so important for the humanity of Jesus Christ to walk and talk on this earth and, and, and come as a man and go to that cross and be that hype, that doctrine of the hyperstatic union. So important. But it does not. It does not conflict with free will. In fact, nobody else could fulfill the role but Jesus Christ. God's plan anticipated human volition. God's plan anticipated human volition. This is where the root of the argument is at for some people who believe in limited atonement what I believe. He anticipated human free will, the, the whole issue of free will. This is where the root of the argument is at for some who believe in limited atonement. The simple answer is, if God is all-powerful and the author of the plan, why wouldn't he know what decision we would make once we came to an age of accountability? Why wouldn't he give us free will and say, yep, I know what they're going to do, but I'm still going to put it out there and I'm going to give them the choice. Why wouldn't he? He's all-powerful. Every denomination that really understands Christianity or claims to would say God can do anything at any time. Look at the Red Sea. That's his overriding will. That, that, that supersedes uh, science and nature. And God has a permissive will, we know. And God has his perfect will, we know. The three wills of God, I've talked to you about that. So why wouldn't he? Why wouldn't he be able to say, I'm going to give them free will and look down the excuse me, corridors of time and be able to say, I know who's going to choose, who's not going to choose, and I love them no matter what, but they have to make a choice. There's something going on here. There's a conflict. A resolution needs to happen. Why couldn't he do that? When somebody reaches an age of accountability, realize they're going to reject the gospel several times, and that's going to be it. God's plan for eternity past anticipates human volition involved in their first sin. The first sin we see. God's plan from eternity past anticipates human volition, and it was involved in the first sin we ever saw in the garden. It anticipates human volition in believing on the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. It anticipates human volition in rejecting Christ. It anticipated all of that. God's not powerful enough to anticipate where we would go once we're given free will. Think about that statement. Makes no sense. But here we have it related to the person of Jesus Christ in Acts 2.23. It does not mean foreknowledge. It is stronger than that. Stronger. It means predetermined purpose. Something set up, a uh, sound. It's like building a foundation and saying that's the size of the house. That's what it's going to be. That's it. We know. It's predetermined. Not maybe I kind of know what's going on. No, it's predetermined. It's part of the plan. It's the purpose of the plan. So Jesus Christ was delivered by the predetermined decree of God the Father. Jesus Christ was delivered by the predetermined decree of God the Father. That's why nobody could get in its way. It's already done in eternity past. Understand that principle. And as Christ got elevated and elected to a certain position, so too do we. God's plan was designed in eternity past to include Listen to me closely, folks. All actions, negative or positive, in your life, my life, everybody's life since the garden. All decisions, negative or positive, now passed into the future. Anything related to a person's causes and conditions as part of an inseparable system 
where every action and reaction are part of the integrity of the whole system. Again, I will leave that up there and I'll read it to you again. Take a moment. God's plan was designed in eternity past to include all action, negative or positive, all decisions, negative or positive, anything related to a person's causes and conditions as part of an inseparable plan. They cannot be separated. We can't think, well, God changed this now because of that. It's already done. It's inseparable. Where every action and reaction are part of the integrity of the whole system. Understand what I'm telling you. You cannot change the plan of God. You can only clawed up and muddy up and screw up your own plans, your own goals and blessings and rewards and things like that. But God even knew you were going to do that. And he even made account, uh, accountable different points of time where you can flow back into the plan of God. Why do you think we have, as believers, a way to drop back into the new nature because the old sin nature got the best of us? Your old sin nature in this human body, in this flawed time, in this temporal time we have in, your old sin nature is bucking against you. So relax. If you feel like uh, schizophrenic, I think my pastor used to say, like Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde sometimes, that's accurate. That's the battle you're called to fight. Our flesh is sometimes the biggest battle we're called to fight. So it's not you beat yourself up. You use the tools given to you. You acknowledge this sin. There's a failure there along the way. You acknowledge it. You don't get guilty and shame over it because that only changed sins. You're caught in sin after that. Emotional nonsense. You name and cite it. Wash it clean. Apply the Word of God and get back into the Word of God. Now, there are some things that get caught. you get caught up in that you need to turn from before it turns to evil. And you need to turn fully back to God and really do your best to stay away from that. So you have to be careful how you handle those situations. We can look at that in the future. But we're all going to have fumbles, failures, and sin nagging us until we're face-to-face -face with the Lord in a perfect body, in a perfect environment. So relax. Anything related to a person's causes, conditions, failures, whatever, today, tomorrow, 30 years from now, as part of an inseparable system, he have figured it out for you, where every action, reaction, are part of the integrity of the whole system. The theological definition here of the do doctrine of divine decrees, we say decree, the decree of God, is eternal. His eternal, holy, wise, and sovereign purpose, comprehending it once, once all things that ever were or will be. This is how we have to look at this. You have to look at it as a big whole picture. You can't pick and choose that God is mad at you today and he changed the plan for your life. It doesn't work that way. That gets us in a lot of trouble. That gets us into works programs. The theological definition of the doctrine of divine decrees, the decree of God is his eternal, holy, wise, and sovereign purpose, comprehending at once all things that ever were or will be in their causes, conditions, successions, and relationships, and determining their certain outcomes. Not my definition. It's a theological definition. I think this one comes from Lewis Sperry Schaefer, who is my spiritual great-great-grandfather. I am in the line of Lewis Sperry Schaefer. So if you read any Lewis Sperry Schaefer books, who was the expert really on uh, early dispensationalism, that's my guy. That's what my lineage, that's what I believe is accurate. I believe the majority of Lewis Sperry Schaefer's teaching is dead on. Just like I believe Colonel R.B. Theme Jr., who was under Lewis Berry Schaefer, is dead on as a theologian, as a pastor. Now, are there some things they say, terms or things that they said that I might disagree a little bit here and there? I go, I go where God the Holy Spirit leads me, but I'm not going to change whole doctrines. That's craziness. And that, you need to be careful of that. Be careful of the teachers that have heavy revies every time you turn around, and they got a new doctrine off the top of their head. Be careful of that. But... Do, is there a certain term, terminology, I believe, and little twists and turns along the way that I think they may have been off, that I, that I believe the Spirit's leading me? Possibly, yes. No man is perfect. Perfect one died on the cross. So, here's the theological definition, divine decrees. The de decree of God is, is He is eternal. He is holy. He is wise. He is sovereign. All-powerful purpose. Comprehending at all, once all things, nothing left out, that ever were or will be, in their causes, conditions, successions, and relationships, and determining their certain outcomes. 
Great definition. That explains it. God has designed a plan so perfect that it takes into account free will on every level. Well, he can't do that. Why can't he? He designed the universe. He blew it into existence. He created man from the dust of the air, the dirt on the ground, excuse me. God has designed a perfect plan so it takes into account free will on every level from every human being ever born. And it included angelic responses and actions. It includes the whole package, folks. You can't get away from it. It includes cause and effect, directives, uh, facilitation, safeguards, and function for all believers, folks. God does all this knowing unbelievers and satanic forces will be active, and he knows it all, in every nook and cranny, and he estimated how these negative forces would act, react, and manipulate circumstances. Let me say it again. So knowing all this stuff, like I said, with the slide on the board, includes all causes and effects, directives, facilitation, safeguards, functions for all believers, really all people, but when we look at believers for our plan, and God does all this knowing that unbelievers... Satanic forces will be active in every nook and cranny, and he estimated how these negative forces would act, react, and manipulate circumstances in all our lives. Under his plan, God has decreed to do some things directly, some things through the agency of Israel and the church, and some through individuals. I can't find a better way to say this than the expert who wrote it way before me. Therefore, there are primary, secondary, and tertiary, third we would say, functions within the plan of God. But all these constitute one great, all-comprehensive plan, perfect, eternal, unchangeable, without loss of integrity. Thank you, Colonel R.B. Theme Jr. for your great theology. I couldn't think of a better way to write it than somebody like that, who I consider the closest thing to a genius that I know, certainly with the Bible, that I know. Now, is there some areas that uh, I use different terminology, or I don't use all the military applications of everything, and Colonel Thien, <laughs> gotta love him. Yes, but the majority of his theology is dead on. So what you believe what you want to believe, hearing that, and you know that, you can make a choice whether I'm your pastor or not, because that's the direction I go in. Now, there's some little things along the way that I'm like, eh, I don't always agree with that term or this or that. But I'm not going to get away from that theology. The bulk of it, under his plan, God has decreed to do some things directly and some things through the agency of Israel and the church and some through individuals. Therefore, there are primary, secondary, and tertiary functions within the plan of God, but all these constitute one great, all-comprehensive plan, perfect eternal, unchangeable, without loss of integrity, Colonel Arby Theme Jr. Thank you. The plan of God is consistent with human freedom. It's a great way to say it. I, that's from me, I guess. <laughs> the plan of God is consistent with human freedom, free will. It's okay. You can't exclude it. It works into the plan. God knew about it. He's all-powerful. Why wouldn't he know about it? Why wouldn't he give us free will and then realize down the corridors of time what you would choose? I'm going to close with a couple of principles that are important to understand. What type of God would we have who does not give us freedom of choice? What type of God who wouldn't give us freedom? Who wants to be the jealous, controlling husband? Just the fact that God created human volition that allows God's, uh, the God's freedom given to us of choice is the reason there's sin. Just the fact that God created free will, volition, human volition, that God allows freedom of choice is the reason for sin. That's where it came from, folks. The sin nature is a result of what? Imperfection of man outside the will of God. That's a simple definition. I didn't know any other way to say it. Some of these are, most of these stuff, obviously, I'm talking to you about is my, my own notes. The sin nature is a result of the imperfection of man outside the will of God. That's a definition for it right there. This was not a design by God, but a part of his permissive will. We've talked about the will of God. And it was suited for the overall plan of God in eternity past. It fit in and done. God does not limit or coerce human freedom. However, 
a distinction should be made between what God causes, like looking at the cross, and what God permits, like looking at sin. There it is right there. The sin nature is a result of imperfection man has outside the will of God. Now I talk about flowing inside the will of God, perfection. Outside, which you're free to do at any given time, freedom, is outside the plan of God. That's imperfection. That's where sin came from, folks. This was not a design by God, but part of his permissive will, so it all fit together, and it was suited for the overall plan in eternity past. God does not limit or coerce or bribe human free will and play games with it. However, a distinction should be made between what God causes, like the cross, and what God permits, like sin. Because if something has to happen in God's plan exactly the way his perfect will permitted, it's going to happen. Free will will not get in the way. <laughs> Just let you know. So all these apostles getting emotional and stepping in front of the Lord saying, no, you shouldn't go to the cross. It was going to happen no matter what. God created man with free will. Created us with free will. He permits human freedom, folks, to function. This is how Adam sinned. Adam and Eve, they were given complete freedom. They were given rules and regulations to say, listen, guys, I'm going to give you a whole bunch of great things. There's going to be like one thing you can't do. What's the thing mankind does? The one thing God says they can't do. God is not the author of sin, period. God is not the author of sin. Man's volition is the source of sin in the human race. God cannot tempt or in any way authorize or create sin. It makes no sense that God can tempt and create sin and get us into sin. It does not coincide with who and what God is. Sin and evil are completely the result of freedom, not God creating them. Sin and evil are completely the result of freedom, not God creating them and rubbing his hands together and said, I'm going to create evil and sin and put it in man. No, he said, I'm going to create man um, that he can go outside of my will and in order to go outside my will, I have to allow imperfection because I am perfect. Simple math, folks. Simple math. Freedom in any realm, spiritual or natural, has principles. It gives way to mistakes. It gives way to evil, flaws, not by design, but by the mere unleashing of certain restrictions. Think about it. Freedom, whether you're looking at it in the spiritual or natural realm, even an unbeliever that believes in freedom like in this country or whatever, it gives way to mistakes. It allows for evil. It allows for flaws. Not by design, but by the mere unleashing of certain restrictions. True freedom means individuals are allowed room for error and personal, uh-oh, responsibility. That's real freedom. Yep, it means there's going to be some messy times and some errors and flaws. Maybe evil will creep in there because that's freedom. But there's responsibility in that. If you handle it the right way, you can deal with it. True freedom means limitations are not, or excuse me, true freedom means limitations are only bound, only bound by common laws such as uh, violent behavior, we would say, absolutely, there's probably a short list, personal property, minimal interference by any governing body. That's what real freedom looks like on the surface when we want to give a quick definition, whether it's spiritual or natural. There are some, we could say, limited or limitations or boundaries, common laws that make common sense. Because real freedom doesn't mean you can impose your will and your violence upon somebody else. Then you're taking their freedom away. Think about it. Violence and theft of personal property and damage and those kind of things, or trying to minimize what somebody says or does, that's taking their freedom away. So then you have, there's got to be a balance. There has to be some kind of guideline there. Freedom is defended and upheld by appropriate law enforcement and the military. That's the only way it works, folks. And even that, it's not 100% perfect because we're not perfect till we go to heaven. But freedom is defended and upheld by appropriate law enforcement, not over laws and over taxing and, and uh, controlling people. The military is involved in that as well. You have to have it. Living under God's plan demands recognition of his authority and adjusting to his system. Living in God's plan demands recognition of his authority, can't get away from it, and adjusting to his system. And that's a daily thing. In eternity, we will live without the ties of human regulations or choices for or against God in eternity 
because true perfection and divine happiness only come from full submission to who and what God is. So therefore, in the temporal, it's a little jacked up, I would say. Because of what? Because there's a cosmic system run by fallen angels. We have an old sin nature. We have freedom. We have free will. Of course, it's going to be jacked up. But true perfection and divine happiness, it will come. And it only comes from what? Full submission to who and what God is. That's where when you get to heaven, there's no more of the nonsense. What do you mean? There's no free will in heaven. It's done away with because you're in perfection. You realize, oh my gosh, this is the only way to perfect happiness and perfect freedom. God's way, submission to him. That is why the easiest definition of hell, folks, is simple. What is it? Separation from God. Easiest definition to explain hell when somebody asks you and unbelievers arguing with you, why is there hell? Well, that's God giving you what you wanted. As soon as somebody tells you, why is there a hell? They stamp their feet and they're all self-righteous about God being uh, unjust and he's not fair and he made a hell. Yeah, he did. But he gave you your freedom. You have freedom. So the easiest definition of hell, simple definition I always give to people is, it's a separation from God. You didn't want it, what he offered you. Therefore, there's imperfect, imperfection and there's perfection. God's way is perfection. There's real happiness or there's pseudo and counterfeit happiness. Two lanes. Two ways to choose, folks. Every head is bowed, every eye is closed. Father, we thank you for this time. Please, Father, our current president in the White House, we know a lot is going on. Keep him in the protection he's under currently right now, Father. And allow the things to happen on January 20th that are in your plan, Father. Please, through your son's precious name, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ.